All right. Um, let me get started. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board in Vermont. Today is August 28, 2024. It's 101 p.m. and I call this meeting to order. Um, any changes to the agenda that we need to make? No. no, no. Okay. Um, just a quick word about some of our public engagement. Um, this is a very critical time of the year for any number of reasons, but um, at least for the CCB side, this is a time where we start to make changes to our rules and start conversations with legislators about uh, what we need to help this market continue to evolve. Um, you know, there's certain things that we absolutely need to do. Um, update our medical rules, including developing regulations governing the medical use endorsement, um, cr create criteria for retail siting, as well as tier expansion and relegation. Um, there's things that the legislature wants us to do. Um, they've asked us for an updated fee proposal um they want us to consider how the siting of outdoor cannabis cultivation might be changed uh recommend how much money should be dedicated to the cannabis business development funds and consider the impact of modifications to the advertising laws we've also been hearing from the industry that there are changes that they would like to see um a pathway to direct consumer more packaging options a streamlined license renewal and product registration process, greater clarity around testing requirements, um, and more flexibility around potentially hazardous foods. I want to thank everyone who added their voice to our uh, licensee roundtables. I know it's a lot to ask of people that are already running a small business in a heavy, heavily regulated market to also be an advocate and problem solver with the board. Uh, we really appreciate your input and are in the process of converting what we heard into action items. Um, and for anyone that wasn't able to join um, and has thoughts to share, I encourage you to go back and try to watch some of those um, roundtables, as well as the first meeting of our Cannabis Social Equity Working Group, um, and send us your feedback. Um, those videos are on YouTube, our YouTube channel, and there's a big kind of public input forum button uh, on our webpage. Um, also, just keep your eye out on our event calendar that's on our website. We have um, a number of public meetings related to some of these legislative work groups uh, coming up. Um, and we'll also have several meetings dedicated to reviewing proposed rule amendments. Um, those are all great opportunities to share um, to help shape the direction of the market. Anything anyone wants to add to that? No, no, thank no. you. All right. Um, have you guys had a chance to review the draft minutes from our last regular meeting and our evidentiary hearing on 814? Yes. Yes. All right. Is there a motion to approve those? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, let's go into public comment. Um, we'll handle this the same way we always do. Uh, if you join by the link and would like to make a public comment, Please just raise your virtual hand. We'll try our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand, and then we'll move to anyone who's joined by a phone. Dave? No, thanks. Um, pretty minor, um, but this is just something that comes out of conversations I've been having with compliance staff lately. And, you know, I, I, I'm not complaining about compliance staff. They're doing a fine job. They're, you know, they're not wrong uh, about this, but it, it, it's just um, a lot of folks in this industry want to be a little creative uh, with products that we put out there. And one thing that's, that I know, I know we're looking at and other folks are looking at is um, trying to make pre-rolls uh, with both cannabis and hemp in order to do uh, a higher CBD content. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a pathway to do that that would meet uh, the compliance team's approval on product registration. And to me, uh, you know, that, that seems like something that could maybe use a little bit of higher level um, thought uh, from the board uh, with some guidance to the compliance team as to what it is that that they should be looking for to ensure safety on this stuff. It doesn't seem like a, a thing that should be prohibited. Uh, there should be ways to ensure consumer safety. And, you know, just to be clear about this, people are already doing this on their own, you know, buying CBD hemp and combining it with cannabis in order to add CBD 
to their THC. And so, you know, we in the market want to provide that on a regulated, in a regulated way in one product. And we are looking to you to give us a, a pathway for doing that in a safe and regulated manner. Um, and I would really appreciate some guidance from you down to your compliance team so that they know how to do it safely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Tito? Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, David. Um, that That's actually something that we're dealing with in our company directly. We We actually grow super high CBD hemp right in our indoor grow alongside of our high THC cannabis. But then we we blend the we blend the ground flower into a joint together. So it's not it's not one one cultivar that both has high CBD and high THC. We're actually blending the the ground product. And um, you know as it would be really great if we could use the original COAs rather than having to submit a brand new um uh brand new sample for testing to get a new coa for for it as if it was an infused product which it's not it's really just a flower pre-roll um so I, I second that if we could have a clear path forward using the original coas would be the best and uh next um i just want to make a comment about the the future medical um selling medical cannabis out of the dispensaries uh it feels like the process should be absolutely as simple as possible so in other words medical patient gets up to the cash register and uh, they, they say they're a medical patient, the bud tender at that point can just push a button, uh, says medical patient, and then they don't have to pay the taxes like a normal customer. And that's it. Hopefully everybody's had a great day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tito. Anyone else? And if you're joined by a phone and would like to make a comment, it's star six to unmute your phone. Not seeing anyone else, so I will close the public comment window. Um, thanks for the input. Um, and uh, Olga, I'll turn things over to you. Sounds good. All right, so here we are, um, our executive director report for the month of August. Uh, let's see. Um, as always, a quick update on our outreach initiatives. Um, the roundtables took place earlier this month, and our chair has discussed that already. And again, a reminder to anyone that you can find all of the recordings from all three roundtables on our website and on uh, link links to those recordings on our website or you can also go directly to our youtube channel and find them there uh, we are currently working um, on the plan for the next month's peer networking event and patrick our outreach education manager will advertise the selected topic in our weekly newsletter as soon as the team is ready to announce what the topic is. So stay tuned for that. Moving on, um, our adult use program licensing data. Uh, just a reminder here that the data in this PowerPoint is current as of August 15th, unless it's noted otherwise on the individual slides. Okay. Here is our usual look at the current active licenses uh, with just a slight change. Uh, typically, we focused on just the current month's data, but now we are also including the prior month's data to help us better identify and track any trends. So what you're seeing here is a snapshot of all active licenses, including renewals, as of July 15th and also as of August 15th. 
So July is blue and August is orange. You could see if we did the math, in July, we've had a total of 564 active licenses. Uh, the numbers have decreased slightly in August, uh, so we are down to 560. What we gained mm -hmm. and what we lost, we gained a few manufacturer licenses, as you could tell, and also a few retail licenses. And we are seeing a drop in the number of cultivator licenses. No concerning trends overall, though, as the total number of licenses remains stable months over months. That's a quick visual. Um, now, this is uh, this slide has some new data points that I would like to share with the board. This slide uh, highlights businesses that hold multiple active licenses and show various combinations of those license types. Additionally, we are looking at a year-over-year -year comparison between the data collected in June 2023 and now to illustrate the changes in the numbers. For example, here you could see that the most popular license combination is and actually has been a cultivator and a manufacturer. We had 16 businesses that held these licenses in June of 2023, and that number has nearly doubled to 36 uh, in August of this year. Other license combinations have seen uh, minimal changes a year over year, uh, with just a slight growth in single digits or no change at all. Um, again, just another new slide to help us better understand the trends. Olga, does the six cultivator, manufacturer, and retailer, does that include the integrated licenses or are those um, the not integrated licenses that like individually held? I actually need to double check. I assume no. I would assume no too, just because there's three integrated licenses. So July or June is just, just shows one. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Or just no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. If, Okay, but again, we'll keep a look, keep an eye on this just to see how we are trending with that. Okay, we good to move on. Okay, uh, that's a familiar slide to you all. Uh, our active licensees through the lens of their priority status, similar to last month, just a slight decrease in the number of standard uh, licenses. We are seeing. Um, numbers remaining pretty steady, months over one month. We, the standard category dropped by six, and I believe we've seen maybe a very small growth in the other two categories. So again, growth percentages and the actual numbers are included in this slide. Okay, going on further. So that is also a new slide created by our fantastic data manager, Liz. So this slide takes a closer look at the license data by county with a focus on priority status. So a lot of data here. It's a snapshot um, of the number of active licenses per county. So we are getting a sense of the business density in each area uh, with the priority status, adding an extra layer of detail. As expected, our largest counties, uh, Windsor and Rutland, have higher license counts with 59 and 50 uh, licensees, respectfully. respectively. And Ch Chittenden County, of course, our most populous county, uh, has the largest, uh, leads the way with 74. And then on the other end, Essex County, our least populous county, has the fewest licenses, with just seven, as you can see. Again, we'll continue to monitor these numbers as well, looking for any emergent trends across uh, counties in the future. But that's sort of the first slide of this kind. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Moving on again. So that is our latest data on the active cultivator uh, licenses. Again, there's just a slight update to the format. 
we are now including data from the prior months as well. So you could see changes months over months versus just the current month's data. The dark blue columns represent July numbers and the orange columns show August data. The most noticeable shifts here, as you could probably tell, um, are the decreases in the tier one mixed category. So we've gone down from 82 in July to 76 in August, and also a decrease reduction of six licenses in tier one outdoor. And then on the other hand, there's just a slight increase in tier twos. We've seen a little bit of an increase in outdoor up by two. Indoor has also gained a license. Um, outside of that, uh, very slight uh, fluctuations um, in all other tiers um, that we could tell. Um, so overall, the numbers are tracking relatively close to those uh, from previous months. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then a quick look at the manufacturer licenses. Um, again, we are using data from the prime months from July as well as August. We are now looking at 78 active manufacturing licenses, um, which is up four. We had 74 in July. And we've seen gains in tiers two and three. So three new licenses in tier two and one in tier three. So nothing, no changes in tier one. Okay. So moving on and into uh, taking a closer look at the renewal data, I know that's something that the board has been looking for. And basically here we are looking at the renewal data and how it compares with uh, initial submissions. So here you could see new licenses issued as well as the licenses renewed for this calendar year, across this calendar year. And the numbers are displayed on a monthly basis. So the light green column represents our initial license applications, and the dark green show renewals processed each month so far this year. So even looking at this visually, um, we could see the, how they stack up against each other over time. As expected, we are seeing fewer initial applications in 2024, reflecting the market's maturation. Uh, and this trend is clearly illustrated by the data. Uh, you probably can see that last month's renewals were particularly high, 108. And that's largely due to our licensing, team, licensing team's focus on processing late renewals. We, we did a lot last month. And then this month, the numbers have returned to a more typical level with uh, 38 renewals processed, trending pretty steadily. Can I just ask a, quick, a mm -hmm. process question? And when we process a, our approval late renewal, that does not change the next renewal date, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, another busy slide here, and it's another new one. Um, again, it's more information on the initial um, applications and renewals. But now we are looking at the data by license type. So I can walk you through this slide. So again, the data covers this calendar year uh, with columns labeled by months. And we start with January initial applications, then January renewal. February initial and so on, all the way through August initial and August renewals. Um, so each column is color coded to represent different license types processed that month. So green is our cultivators, yellow manufacturers, blue wholesalers, and red are retailers. So say we take a look at the May data here, and you can see that uh, in May, Initial applications were divided among 13 cultivator applications, uh, six manufacturers, and three retailers, um, those approvals. And then renewals for May included 31 cultivator submissions, five manufacturers, and eight retailers. So again, a lot of information here. Um, 
could probably tell at a glance that cultivators continue to be our most popular, um, as we all know, uh, license type. Um, but that tell gives you a little more who is applying and who is renewing on a monthly basis. Okay. So that's one slide. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah okay. You. And this is a sort of a similar slide, again, focuses on the issued licenses uh, and renewals. Only now we are looking at the data um, by priority status. So again, it's a data field slide, so we could take our time here. The data covers this calendar year yet again, and now the columns, um, it's the same idea, the columns are labeled by months uh, with initial and renewals. Uh, uh, listed in order, go all the way through August, except this time each column is color coded to represent different priority statuses. So blue is our social equity, green is economic empowerment, and orange is standard. So again, if we were to look at May, May data, you could tell that initial applications were divided among 12 standard five economic empowerment and five social equity, and then May renewals included 25 standard, 14 economic empowerment and five social equity. So again, another way to look um, at uh, the license, uh, license applications and renewals months over months. Over months. Okay, You're good. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Moving on. So that's our uh, canopy capacity square footage data, uh, a familiar slide. Not much change here, indoor licensed canopy is tracking closely to the last month's numbers and outdoor capacity dropped by about 5,000 square feet um, from July. So keeping steady on these numbers. So if we're good here, we'll move on to the retail locations and areas of density. Uh, as a reminder, just the towns with two or more retail locations and or retail applications in the queue are represented here. For August, we have seen a gain in the number of applications in the licensing queue, going from seven in July to 13 in August. So. Um, growing numbers here. And um, as in the past, it's Burlington, Morrisville, and Rutland that have the highest concentrations of retailers or applications in the queue. Uh, we could You could see that Johnson has made it on the list for the first time with two initial applications. And Winooski is now on the list uh, with one license and one application. And Morrisville, they're adding two, Morris, two more. Morrisville. Yes, so we had six total. Yes, a lot happening in Morrisville. <laughs> yep. Okay, moving on. Um, so now we are gonna switch gears and take a look at their pre-qualification data. So our licensing team has received a total of 172 uh, pre-qualification applications so far. We had 168 in July, so we've gained four additional submissions this month. And looking at this chart, you could see a breakdown um, between different statuses that these applications are in currently. Um, and again, the largest subset of our applicants, 80, um, have, be, uh, have been approved. So we are trending again, close to half of all submissions um, are currently approved. Other statuses are listed here as well. And right. next slide, we could look closely at the approvals. So again, we've recorded 80 approvals so far, up from 78 last month. Uh, so very little change here with our indoor cultivated tier ones, um, securing the most approvals and being most represented here. Again, just a slight change months over months. 
Uh, and now that's the final slide here. It shows that 38 out of those 80 approvals have since been converted into full applications, so almost half. Okay. And we've gained three um, July into August, so three additional um, full applications are in the queue now. Um, again, you can look more closely at the breakdown by specific license types here and tiers. And I believe uh, the three gains uh, we saw in tier one cultivator, an additional retailer and an additional manufacturer tier, uh, one of the manufacturers. All right. Yeah. And can I just ask yes. licensing a question, kind of a subjective question is, uh, are we, those people that have been through prequal, are their initial applications kind of in better shape than what we had seen originally? Okay. That was a yes by licensing. <laughs> He's not on camera right now. Yeah. Good. All right. So that's all for uh, pre-qualification. And again, so next we'll look a little closer again at the product registration data. We did a deeper dive into PR last month um, and we'll continue to build upon that work and have a few new data points to offer to the board this month. So I'll dive in. So first, I'd like to highlight the recent change in our product categories. Again, our wonderful data manager has revamped the available categories, resulting in a more detailed list that should make reporting easier and cleaner. So new product categories are listed in red, and so we now include options for seeds and clones. In the past, everything was just coded as other, really. Uh, and there was some additional confusion. Um, so we've also clarified the extract category by combining concentrates and extract into single group, again, for clarity. Uh, and these updates are part of our ongoing process improvement efforts um, aimed at streamlining the product registration process. So just a quick highlight here on the work that's been done. And now we'll just, I have three slides that will illustrate the proportions of various product types. Um, again, as, as we look at them through the lens of new product submissions and renewals. So that's what we are tracking separately. Um, so again, it's a snapshot in time as of August 15th, and you could see new registrations are in green and renewals are in blue. Um, the proportions here vary significantly depending on specific product types. Um, I would like to highlight 22 new registrations for clones that we have received thus far. Um, and overall, you could probably see that new registrations of number renewals across all categories still. So that's slide number one on this first five product types. Um, moving on to the next slide again, that's the second slide on the same topic. You could see now that we have a separate category for vape cartridges. We used to, we were not able to report on this specific product in the past. So now it is available. So we could see again, similar trends with renewals and um, new, registra new registrations dominating renewals so far. And one more slide here, uh, and that's our flower and pre-roll registrations and renewals. Snapshot of time here, and as expected, uh, it continues to be our most popular product type with very large numbers of registrations. <laughs> um, so that's, that's those three slides here. And I have one more, I believe, and this final slide. So last month, Julie requested uh, a little more information on why some product registrations take significantly longer to process mm -hmm. than others. Uh, and to recap, last month's data indicated that topicals and tinctures, on average, have the longest timelines uh, from PR submission to registration. So this slide includes um, 
on, on one side to the right I, or left, depending on how you're looking. Uh, a quick screenshot from last month's report uh, showing PR approval timelines as a reminder. And then additionally, our product registration team has provided some insights uh, to address Julie's questions about PR challenges. And the main points are summarized here. So you could take a look and see that when it comes to tinctures, mm -hmm. it's all of the calculations that need to take place for infused products. It's multiple tests, again, that produce a large number of COAs. And on that point, um, the PR team um, has offered an example of one licensee who went an extra mile by consolidating 34 COAs into one PDF to help uh, expedite the registration process. So again, some creativity here um, in our community as well to help move things along. So thank you very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Okay, so that is a wrap sort of on that subset of data, and we'll now look at our compliance and enforcement data. Let's see, so here is a summary of the agency's work for the last month. So 79 regular inspections, and which is up from 60 last month, and our agents are working through eight active investigations uh, right now. You could see blue and red separate inspections and investigations. Um, and you can also look closer at the specific types of licensees who are subject to their recent inspections and investigations. So the investigations are those, um, like are those random investigations or are those complaint driven or all of the above? Yes, yes, it's okay. a formally assigned. So we may receive a complaint. Some complaints are being pushed into investigative phase yep. by the compliance team upon analyzing the complaint. And some may not go that route, but those are the active investigations okay. assigned. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so another chart here um, has further breakdown of the field team's activities over the months. So again, you could tell the team has recorded and processed 33 new complaints, um, issued seven letters of warning, a couple notices of violation, couple product destruction, they observed a couple product destructions and oversaw three cessations of operation. A huge thank you to our team led by our interim compliance and enforcement director, Mike DiTomaso, for all of this fine work. Um, they're busy out there. Yeah, thank you, compliance. Mm -hmm. um, we're down a compliance agent because yeah. of that. Um, is that reflect, is these numbers reflective of being down a person mm -hmm. or? Other no, the team has definitely stepped up. We we were the numbers were a little bit lower actually last month because of people uh, folks taking vacations. Yeah. But everybody is back and everybody right. is pulling strong right now. Yep. So yeah, um, yeah. But they are doing a lot of work. We are very grateful given that they are short staffed. Yep. Um, okay. And this final compliance related slide offers um, a chart that flashes out the types of violations that have been reported uh, to the team or observed by the field agents. And again, the most recent complaints, uh, the most, um, uh, you could tell the recent complaints, they cover a variety of topics, uh, but advertising continues to be the most common complaint type. About the third, actually a third of all complaints received is advertising uh, these days. And again, a reminder to the community uh, that the easiest way to report a possible violation, observe violation is to fill out a web form um, that can be found on our website. That's the fastest way and the cleanest way to get your information into the right hands. And that can be done anonymously, yeah. right? I, I know there's a section where you fill mm -hmm. out name and contact information, but it can be yeah. done anonymously. Obviously, if it's done anonymously, yeah. it's hard for us to follow yeah. up with, with you know, the complainer about yeah. some of the specifics. But um, yeah. yeah, yeah, but we appreciate any and all complaints and however you can get them to us. Our team is ready to review and process. But those are time. public records. So yes. are you 
submit a complaint. Yeah. Just keep in mind that someone could request that yeah. information. Yeah. I noticed that the dismissed complaints are up here. Does that mean that the rest of the complaints are things that were like actionable? Like they were that it, we I I would have to double check exactly uh, what uh, our folks are doing, but I would say dismissed at the point of receipt. Okay. Read and dismissed versus doing a little more research gotcha. to see if investigation is warranted okay. or not. So good. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And now the medical program data again, we just have one slide. Um, we've actually seen a slight uptick in the number of um, patients and caregivers this month. We are, I think, up 23 patients from 2,712 in July to 2,735 in August. And the caregivers. Uh, trending up a bit too, from 119 to 122. Hmm. So, a uh, slight little increase this month. All right. And so now that was the end of the data reporting for the months, and we are moving into the staff recommendations for licensure. As always, we'll begin with listing staff recommendations for initial licenses followed by a list of license renewals. We do have 14 initial applications on the list and a much larger number of renewals. Uh, and additionally, the staff has prepared a list of late renewal applications for the board to review. So with that, here's the list of our recommendations for initial licensure. It's just one slide here. Uh, good. Now we are moving on to the list of license renewals, and we have three separate slides here. So that's the first one. For anyone joined by a phone, we will post these to our meeting information webpage on our website. I know you're not reading through them because there's so many of them, but we do have a couple of people that join by a phone. Next. The third slide here. Uh, I'll pass briefly here to note uh, that the application of Phantom Farms LLC was accepted at their August 14th meeting, uh, but tabled to this meeting under the rule 1.15.1, and it is now ready for favorable action and listed with the other ordinary renewals, as, uh, renewals seen on this slide. Before we do anything, can I just make a quick aside that I think is an important point that Gabe just reminded me of? That when you make a complaint on our complaint form, that only the date, the nature of the complaint, and the outcome are public documents. Um, you know, there is a possibility that somehow your subject, the complainant, could be discovered in a discovery process, but um, we would refuse a Public Records Act request for all complaints for example, and have a de-identified complaint. So there are ways you can make complaints without, you know, without fear of repercussion. Um, so, you know, we do encourage people to make complaints when they see things uh, that are clear violations. Good point. And it's always yeah. easier for us to kind of dig yeah. into the complaint if we have yeah. the information of the person making the complaint yeah. that we can follow up with. Absolutely. Anything else? 
that I, I don't want to misspeak. I don't, I don't want to. No, that's a good summary of a complex thing. This is totally <laughs> consistent with what other licensing programs, for yes. example, your dentist is licensed, but if somebody asked the dental board, uh, could I see every complaint that was ever made against that dentist? The answer is no, yes. but the person could see every substantiated complaint that led to, to administrative charges. Yeah. Everything's public at that point. That way, if somebody who's an anonymous person online smears you, yeah. it doesn't yes. wind up tarnishing your reputation. However, the public knows exactly what the agency is doing when it does formal things. Yes, great. Okay. Um, all right. So that is, um, those were the uh, renewals. And now here's a list of late renewal applications for the board's review. Again, under the rule 1.15.1D, all of these businesses have supplied all of the required documentation and have also provided explanation, letter, explanation letters for untimely filings. Um, and staff recommends that the board accept and approve this late renewals. Okay. So a couple more slides here. Okay. So the next slide. So here's an additional slide here. So this is, um, so this, the following establishment, uh, and we have three, have uh, filed explanations for untimely filing and supplied all required documentation. However, uh, some element of the application uh, beyond their control prevents the board acting on the application today. Um, so one of these businesses um, has been background checked but awaits refreshed background check results from a third party. The other has supplied deposit account information that is ambiguous as to whether the account meets requirement, their necessary requirements. Uh, and, and our staff recommends that the board accept the late filings and continue the existing licenses in force until the board's regular uh, meeting in September. Correct. So for these three. So these have, have something missing, but it's outside of the control of the yes. licensee. Okay. Yep. So that's, um, and then I do have one final slide. And so this following establishments have not supplied timely and sufficient applications to renew their current licenses. Uh, the licenses will expire at the conclusion of the existing license period on the dates noted in parentheses here. So you could see uh, those dates on the slide next to the names of the businesses. Uh, well, this most often occurs when an applicant offers um, nothing to show compliance with insurance or banking requirements. Um, the estab these establishments were invited to complete their applications and include a written explanation for untimely filing under Rule 1.15 one D, but have not. Uh, consequently, uh, consequently, there is really no question for the board uh, to take up today with respect to this uh, businesses. Any questions about these? No, other than procedurally how we would like to move forward um, with approvals with voting. Okay. Well, so these we do not need to take any action on. These will just kind of play out yep. as a matter of course. Correct. It seems like we can accept staff recommendations for everything. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Unless we want to talk about them individually. Like they do the different buckets. So that is my question yeah. to, to you if, okay. and procedurally, Mr. Chair, how would you like to do that? I'm fine with accepting the staff recommendations as okay. presented. Um, but I'm opening it up to to you and Kyle if you'd like if you would like to talk about the late with it with all required late but complete versus late but in need of continuation. If you want to talk about those separately, I'm happy to do so. No, I think I'm good for now. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm good too. I just want to impress upon everybody that please take the 120, the 90, the 60, the 30 day notices seriously. I feel like sometimes we're teachers reminding you that your final project is due and there's no extension date. Although I think we've been pretty um, understanding to lots of different reasonings as to why your 
your license application might be in after um, the dates with which your license is set to expire. Just please understand that just hitting the submit button isn't really the end of the, the conversation or the story. Your application needs to be complete, which means you need to start this before the, the week before that is due. And this license is in some ways your livelihood and your ability to keep conducting business legally um, in this market. It's extremely important um, to make sure that you're on top of those things. And we're learning and we're trying to figure out ways to make the renewal process easier, but we need your uh, support and cooperation to do that. Um, I think we saw the one slide on how many late renewals happened in July. And you know, it's harder for us to conduct and our staff to conduct the day-to-day -day business that we need to do if we're trying to, to push everybody onto the agenda and, and do those specific things for each individual licenses. Um, it's not sustainable um, from our perspective, and I can't see us continuing to make these accommodations after this year. So uh, be mindful in your next renewal cycle that take the auto-generated notices very seriously and start asking questions and gathering your, docu your documents well in advance. In the meantime, as a board, we are thinking about ways to streamline the renewal process, but I don't want to excuse anybody who's who's submitting a late application and, and letting them off the hook by making the renewal process easier. It's it's extremely important to you, it should be, and it's extremely important to us here. And I feel like the chair, Julie and myself are broken records. We've been saying this for the last four or five months. Um, and I think we're getting a little, um, we're losing a little empathy in doing so. At least I am. Thanks, yeah. And part of um, that Act 166 report, Social Equity Working Group is also looking at business assistance and technical assistance and support that the state can invest in to help people. Because, you know, relying on our licensing team and our compliance team to be doing a lot of this technical assistance and support is very challenging as well. Just start asking questions well in advance. We want to help you, um, but doing it at 11.59 is before the clock strikes midnight uh, puts everybody way behind the eight ball. Mr. Chair, since you're contemplating a blanket motion, maybe I should just say out loud what effect that would have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, um, so you've seen seven tables of yes. licensee names. You're right. Uh, a blanket approval of staff recommendations would mean that everyone listed on the first five tables would be recommended for approval, every okay. um, establishment. On the sixth of the seventh table, you have establishments that were uh, recommended to be accepted late, but continued because there's some third party thing that is needed. Um, they would not be approved. Okay. Um, they would be extended until your next board meeting and you would take action on them at that board meeting. And then in the seventh of the seven slides, you had those two entities that really haven't completed and submitted right. applications. This is just a way to notify folks that they're going to expire. Um, there would be no board action on those two right. because that one's just informational. So I just, because there's so much in that bucket, I just want right. to break out what is Thank happening. You. Do you think for the sake of clarity, we should divide it up into initial, the kind of the first five slides, then the next two slides? I mean, yeah, we could do if you'd like. I mean, I could just kind of break out the cups, and then we could do a so moved or something. And we could, and yeah. that way there'd be a clear. Or the um, Gabe did prepare motions okay. for each of those sort of categories. Yeah, why don't we do it that way? The kind of different motions, um, just so it's very clear what's going on. Okay. And that yeah, no <laughs> um, it might be helpful if you went back to that first, the initial licensure, and that way that's up. So one of those pages is up when we make the motion so that it's clear yeah, so in the recording, like what we're doing. Okay. Are we going to do initial licensure and renewal all at the same time? No, we'll do them separate. I, if we okay. could do them separately. Yeah. Are you ready for a motion? I'm ready. Yes, please. <laughs> I move that the board adopt the staff recommendations to approve the applications listed in uh, listed issuance subject to final payment of required fees and any other contingencies. Hold a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then if you go to the ordinary renewals, yep. 
I move that the board adopt staff recommendations to approve the applications listed, issuance subject to final payment and required fees and any other contingencies. I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the late acceptance and approval. Is that this? Yep. Um, I move that pursuant to rule, oh no, pursuant to rule 1.15.1, I move that the board act favorably on the request of the applicants listed to have their renewal applications accepted late and that the board adopt staff recommendations to approve the applications issuance subject to final payment of required fees and any other contingencies. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then uh, pursuant to rule 1.15.1, I move that the board accept the late applications listed, continue the license in force until, regular, until our regular September meeting and defer action on the applications until that meeting. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and that is the last thing on our agenda for today. Um, we will have another evidentiary hearing likely uh, mid-month and then our next board meeting at the kind of end of the month. Anything we need to cover before we adjourn? I think so. No? All right. I'll adjourn the meeting then. Thank you all.